Thank you for joining us for another lesson from God's Word. The Streetsboro Church of Christ is located at 1386 Russell Drive, Streetsboro, Ohio, 44241. If you're ever in the area, we hope that you'll stop in and worship with us. We hope that you'll enjoy this lesson brought to you by our minister, Ralph Price. It's not all that uncommon to hear people say that they believe in God, that they believe in Jesus, and that they love God, and that they love Jesus. But they don't care too much for the church. I hear that all the time from individuals. Yeah, I believe in God, and, and I believe in Jesus, and I'm a Christian, they would say, but I, I'm not a member of any church. It's a common misconception, really, uh, among many, that one can be a Christian and not be a member of the church. I think we understand in regard to the nature of the church, the church is not a building such as we are in today. It is not a worship service. We often say we're going to church and we mean we're going to a worship service. I understand that we use those words interchangeably, but um, that is not what the church is. And the passage which was just read for us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23 there, uh, Peter mentioned the fact that the ones to whom he were writing were born again. They are Christians, and Christians are the church. Let me suggest that if we are faithful servants of God, God not only wants us to be an active part of His church, if we are not, and if we don't love the church, we're actually disobeying God. Here in, in 1 Peter 1 and verse 22, Peter mentions a sincere love of the brethren and that we are to love one another fervently with a pure heart. Now yes, we're to love all mankind. We're to even love our enemies. But here, Peter mentions a love of the brethren and that is a love of the church. Our lesson today is why I love the church. If we were to sit down and make a list of all of the things in our lives that are most important to us, and maybe even rank them in terms of importance to us, let's ask, where would the church of Jesus Christ rank on that list? Let us ask, would the church of Jesus Christ even make it on my list? And so let's think about this morning a few reasons why all of us ought to love the church of Jesus Christ. Now my first reason is in my mind the strongest and the, and the best reason to love the church and that is simply I love the church of Christ because I love Jesus. Because I love Jesus. To believe that one can love Jesus and at the same time not love His church? It's really foolish when you stop and think about it. Jesus most assuredly loves His church, and we're going to prove that. So if the Lord, whom we love because of all that He has done for us in coming to the earth and dying for our sins, giving up heaven to come to the earth, and setting an example for us, paying the price for our sins, he definitely is deserving of our love and our worship. If He loves the church, what, in what world would I ever think that if I love Him, I can't love His church as well? First of all, He died to create it. He demonstrates His love for the church. In Acts 20 and verse 28, we read that God purchased the church with His own blood, with the blood of Jesus. Think about how much then Jesus must care for and love the church if He was willing to shed His own blood, and by shed His own blood we mean die, 
He was willing to give his life in order to establish that church. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul is, is talking about uh, marriage. And uh, he uses the example of Christ's relationship with his church to talk about a husband's relationship with his wife. And Paul says in Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, Husband, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Does Jesus love the church? Yes, absolutely. He loves her to the extent that he gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So number one, if I love Jesus, I have to love the church because Jesus loved the church so much, he died to establish it. He died to purify the church, to sanctify each and every one of us who have obeyed the gospel. Number two, uh, to demonstrate that the Lord loves his church and therefore I should, the church is described in the scriptures as the bride of Christ. The church is described as the bride of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2, Paul writing to the Corinthian church says, I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And so the church is, is represented symbolically as the bride of Christ. And in Revelation chapter 21 in verses 9 and 10, the church uh, is described there. And uh, it says in verse 10, He carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now you drop down in a few passages, and for some reason I did not put that in my outline. You drop down a few passages and that church that is described as the new Jerusalem is described as the bride uh, of Christ. So the church is the bride of Christ. Now, can you say that you love the Lord but don't love his bride? That doesn't make any sense. Also, the church in regard to Christ is his kingdom. It's his kingdom that he came to establish. In Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19, Jesus says, I say to you that you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And then he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Here Jesus uses the term kingdom of heaven, or his kingdom, and church interchangeably. And so the church of Jesus Christ is also the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So the church, first of all, had to be purchased with his very blood, his life. The church is his bride. The church is his kingdom. The church is also described as his body in scriptures. In Colossians 1 and verse 24, Paul writes, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. And also Ephesians 5, 29 and 30, Paul writes, No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And so, again, can we say, I love Jesus, but I hate his body? That doesn't make any sense. The church is described as his body. Jesus is the head. We are the body if we are faithful servants of Jesus Christ. What does the body do? It does what the head tells it to do. It, it um, performs the tasks that are required by the head uh, in order to survive. And that is our relationship with Christ. Over and over again, when Jesus makes reference to the church in scriptures, he always uses the possessive pronouns. That's his church. He told Peter, I will build my church. In his prayer uh, to God on the night that he was betrayed in John chapter 17, we see there that the church really is a prized possession of Jesus. In John 17 and verse 6, when he's praying to the Father, he says, 
I've manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, but you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Notice he talks about the men that God had given him out of the world. And he says, they were yours, but you gave them to me. Drop down to verses uh, 10 through 12. He says, all mine are yours, and all yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, (coughs) that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. That last part in reference to Judas. Notice he talks about the fact, again, over and over, that God had given him certain people out of the world. He's making reference to his disciples, but also to you and I. As he, in this prayer, says, I don't only pray for these ones, these disciples, I also pray for those who will believe on me through their word. So he views the church as his possession. We belong to him. In 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10, Uh, The church here, Peter describes as a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and again notice, his own special people. And then he talks about our purpose, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So the church is Jesus' prized possession. So again, I ask you, and, and I, I hope you understand, it's, it's not possible to love Jesus and not love His body, to not love His bride, to not love um, His kingdom, to not love that for which He died. Friend, if you're here this morning, we, we're glad that you're here, but know that even if you love the Lord, understand that you have to love His church as well. And that that love must manifest itself uh, in adherence to his teachings regarding the church. Number two, another good reason to love the church. Now the rest of these we'll spend a little bit less time on. But number two, I love the church because in the church I have salvation. In the church I have salvation. And again, this goes to the very nature of what the church is. The church is the saved. And so if an individual says, I'm a Christian, but I'm not a member of a church, they don't even understand what the church is. Because the church is the Christians. That is what makes the church. In Acts 2 and verse 47, we read there on the day of Pentecost, The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So what is the church? It's those who are saved from their sins. Church, uh, ekklesia in the Greek, is actually a word uh, that means called out, is the basic meaning. And the idea in the scriptures is that Christians are called out of the world and into the church, into the kingdom of Christ. We know that God calls us out of the world. In 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18, we read, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. That's a quote from the Old Testament. That tells me that under both the Old Covenant and now under the New Covenant, God commanded His people to separate themselves from the rest of the world, to be a different people. And that's what the church is. The church is a a reference, if you will, the word ecclesia, to call out, is a reference to the fact that that person has escaped the pollutions of the world. And the pollutions of the world, I'm talking about sin, the sin that exists in the world. In 2 Peter 2 and verse 20, Peter says, if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they're again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. This is a passage about backsliding or falling out of the right relationship with God. But the emphasis I wanted to make was a Christian or the church 
uh, is one who has escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so in the church, I have salvation. And consequently, or as a result, those who have never come out of the world, those who have never separated themselves from the world by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're going to be lost. I need to be in the church in order to be saved. In Galatians 5, 19 to 21, we have a list of what we refer to as the works of the flesh, what Paul refers to as the works of the flesh. Many sins are listed there. Adultery and fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, a bunch of different sins and and attitudes that are sinful. And Paul in verse 21 says, Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who have not yet come out of the world, but rather continue just to practice these type of things, and they've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. They're not going to be included in that kingdom, and therefore they will not have salvation. So I love the church because Jesus loved the church. I love the church because in the church I have salvation. Number three, I love the church also because in the church I have a purpose. I have a purpose. Some might object and say, hold on a second. I'm not a Christian, but yet I have purpose in my life. So what do you mean that uh, you love the church because you have purpose in the church? I'm not a Christian, but yet I have purpose. For example, one might say, you know, the purpose in my life right now is to graduate from college. Okay, that's a good purpose. But what about after college? What's your purpose going to be? One might say, I have a purpose in life. My purpose is to raise my children. Okay, that's a good purpose. But what happens when your children are grown up and no longer in your home? What's your purpose then? One might say, I have a purpose. My purpose is to do good at my job, to make money, to provide for my family. Okay, good purpose. What happens when you can't work anymore and you can't earn that money? You see, the world offers us purpose, but only on a really a temporary basis. And so what often happens is that when our perceived purpose in life has been fulfilled, these people are left feeling empty or without purpose or without meaning in their life. I know that this happens. Individuals say, you know, my purpose for the past 20 years has been to rear my children and to provide for my children. They're no longer at home What do I do with myself now? What's my purpose in life since my children are no longer under my care? In the church, that's not the case. In the church, it doesn't matter what stage of life you are in, whether you're a younger person or an older person, you will always have purpose no matter where you are in life. What is our purpose in the church? Number one, my purpose in the church is to glorify God. Matthew 5 and verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they, the men, may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. My purpose in the church is to grow and to mature and become a a stronger Christian as Christ would have me. 2 Peter 3 and verse 18. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. So I have a purpose, and that purpose is to grow and mature. My purpose in the church also is to serve others. In John 13, when Jesus had washed the feet of his disciples, something that was unheard of for a master to do for his students, he says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. And so Jesus here set the example by washing his disciples' feet to, to let them know that you are servants. 
your job is to serve and minister to others. That's different than the way it works in the world. In the world, those who are great have people who serve them, the ones that have power. In Christ's kingdom, if we desire to be great, we have to be servants to all. And then also my purpose in the church ultimately is to make it to heaven and to take as many people with me as I can. 2 Peter 3 and verse 14. Therefore, beloved brethren, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by Him in peace without spot and blameless. That's my ultimate purpose in life, to make it to heaven. And Jesus tells me, you try to bring others with you. Go and preach the gospel to all the world. So the purposes that the church offers me are lifelong. They are things that will occupy me from the time I become a Christian until the time that I leave this earth. We're always going to seek to glorify God by the good that we do. We will always need to grow and mature as Christians. I don't care. And you all know, as those who have been Christians for decades can still grow and mature uh, and, and, and grow in knowledge. There will always be people to serve. There are always going to be people in the world who need our help. And we will constantly struggle and fight to attain that crown of life so that when this life is over, we can say like Paul, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And so see the purpose that life offers? Yes, you can find purpose in life, but those purposes come and go and sometimes people are left without purpose. But yet in the church, I always know my purpose and it will never go away. And then number four, I love the church because in the church, I have a family. In the church, I have a family. Now, we all have families, okay, physical families. But most of us, as we grow older, we, we grow apart a little bit from our families. Maybe we move uh, long distances away and we're no longer uh, around or we don't get to spend as much time with our families as we would like to. Also, death comes in there and sometimes death takes away family members. And so, uh, for example, in my life, I have my brother left and that's it in my physical family that I, that I grew up in. My brother is it right now. But I have a family in the church. God knows that we do better together than we do alone. And you really can go all the way back to the creation when God looked at all that He had created and He looked and He saw that Adam was alone and He said, it's not good that man should be alone. Remember, after each day of creation, He said, it's good. It's good. It's good. Day six, it's not good that man should be alone. God knows that it's not good for man to be alone. And so he offers us the church because as Solomon tells us in Ecclesiastes 4, two are better than one. And if two are better than one, then I would suggest to you that three are better than two uh, in many ways. Okay, I wouldn't say that in marriage, but uh, in regard to uh, the church, yes, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So he certainly knows that we need companionship. We need one another in order to really make it through and prosper and thrive in this life, and so he gives us the church because we are stronger together than we are alone. And that's one of the tragedies, I think, of an individual who says, I'm a Christian, but I'm not a member of a church. I don't associate with other Christians. I tr I'm doing it all alone. Well, that's a very difficult task to do, and I don't even think it's possible. We're stronger together. In Hebrews chapter 10, the Hebrew writer, in verses 23 to 25, he, he points out one of the advantages of being with other Christians and assembling together even. He says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. 
And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So notice, he, he starts out by saying, hold fast the confession of your hope. He, he's saying, remain faithful. And certainly in verse 24, he gives us advice on one of the important aspects of doing that. Consider one another to stir up love and good works. Assemble together and exhort one another, encourage one another. And, and again, these are all aspects of what the church offers us. Brothers and sisters in Christ who care about us, who want to help us to make it to heaven, and we want to help them to make it to heaven. Jesus made the promise in Mark 10, 29 and 30, uh, anyone who has to leave house or brothers or sisters or mother or even wife or children for his sake, he made a promise there in verse 30 that you will receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers, children and lands with persecution and, and in the age to come, eternal life. What's he promising there? He's saying even if you have to forsake your physical family to become a part of God's family, understand that you have a new family. Like I said, I have one physical brother left alive on this earth, but I have hundreds of brothers in the church. I have hundreds of brothers and sisters in the church who I consider to be family just as much as my physical family I consider to be family. And they are there for me to help me. I have uh, women who in the, in the church who are my sister, but I also in many ways look at them as mother-type figures grandfather type figures and I'm sure you have those type of people as well as I was thinking about this I thought you know here at Streetsboro we even have the, the crazy uncle I'm not going to say who that is but it's Barry but we have you know we we have characters and people who uh, we love and and it's a wonderful family to be a part of now, because I said that, he's going to get me next time he's up here probably. Why I love the church? I love it because, number one, Jesus loved it. And if I love him, I'm going to love his church. I love it, number two, because in it I have salvation from my sins. I love it because in it I have purpose in my life that will always be there. And number four, I love it because I have a family in the church. Friend, if you are not a member of the Lord's church, we offer you the opportunity. We want you in the family. God wants you in the family. The way you get into it is not by, you know, going through some elaborate process where you have to apply for membership and be approved by the membership or anything like that. The scriptures say when you're saved, God adds you to his church. And so if you're here and you've never obeyed the gospel, you need to do that. You need to have your sins forgiven, and the Lord will add you to this church, and you'll be a part of our spiritual family. What does it mean to obey the gospel? It means to obey the terms of salvation that Jesus has set forth. We have to have faith in Him, believe that He is the Son of God, John 8 and verse 24, or we'll die in our sins. We have to also repent or turn from the sin in our life, Luke 13, 3, or we will perish. We have to confess our faith in Him, uh, or He won't confess us before the Father. Confession is made unto salvation. And finally, we have to be baptized or immersed in water for the remission of sins, and then continue to live faithfully. Friend, if you've not done those things, we're about to sing a song. The Lord wants you in His church. It's a wonderful life, and we offer you the opportunity at this time to become a member of His church. Maybe you're already a member who's become unfaithful. The invitation is for you as well. If you need to repent of sin in your life, we'd be glad to uh, pray for you and pray with you. We encourage you to come as we stand and sing. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, Ralph can be reached at our price at streetsboroughchurch.org or by calling 330-626-4282.
If you would like to learn more about the Church of Christ, we offer free Bible correspondence courses by mail and home Bible studies. We hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Feel free to come visit us. We would love to have the opportunity to meet you.